Hello there, fellow explorers. I am Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And we've not hexpatriated from our hexploration, as we are crawling back to that one hex we just couldn't leave behind. It's hex crawls again on WebDM. Do you need me to do another one? It's time to return to the world of hexes. <gasps> And I'm talking about warlocks. Oh. Okay. Just the hex crawl, though. Gotcha. Sometimes we like to return to subjects. Sure. To, yeah, uh, yeah. To, to, to fill out all the little, the little gaps to go, to oh, go yeah. a little deeper. A little bit deeper. Yeah. So the last time we, we talked about hex crawls uh, was more of an overview. We discussed some of the, the merits of different hex sizes and, and sort of what are some of the procedures of play that you would use when conducting a hex crawl and how to avoid some of the pitfalls that, mm -hmm. that are traditionally associated with hex crawls, that it's monotonous, you know, repetitive, yeah. uh, and then again, at some point that you're just sort of wandering around the map without, without any real direction. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about the content within those hexes. Yes. And the best yeah. way to pack those hexes. Yeah. So yeah. that they aren't monotonous. Right. And you know, redundant, it's just oh, yeah. oh, same it's just, thing, oh, just the same over and over. Thing. You know, there's two modes of play for the hex crawl. There mm -hmm. is the overland travel in which the hex is a unit of time and distance in this case and, and signifies to the dungeon master, you need to roll some dice or, or check for certain things to happen. Uh, it, it, it's a procedure of play. But let's say they've, they've gotten to the hex that, they, that they're gonna stay at. They're not moving on anymore. They, they've reached that mythical border. What I'm talking about here is six to eight mile uh, hexes. Now, in the first video that we did in the series, I kind of was like settled on the eight mile hex as, as my preferred. I've, I've since sort of waffled a bit on that uh, in oh. that I, I like the... Uh, I like the way the distances break down of a, on a six mile hex as opposed to an eight mile. And the, the eight mile I chose because it breaks down nicely with the way uh, fifth edition's movement rates work uh, in overland travel. But obviously you can sort of do the same thing with a six uh, depending on the movement rate mm -hmm. uh, itself. So one of the reasons why I like, uh, or I chose since then, uh, six mile hex is, is the one I want to feature in the videos and, and use for my home games. Is, is because of the, the simple fact that uh, a human in an otherwise featureless environment can see about three miles. And yeah. so if you're standing in, in, a, in the center of a hex, you can, the horizon is about three miles away. So if you, you know, barring any obstacles in the way, a person would be able to sort of gain an idea or an understanding or, or at least a general sense of what is in the content or what's mm -hmm. in the, you know, what's in the hex itself. Uh, yeah, yeah. Obviously, if it's a jungle or a forest or there's lots of rugged terrain, that's going to mitigate how far they can see. But it's a good baseline to sort of start from. And so right now, we're sort of still at that, that big map level. They're, they're traveling along the, the hexes. You, they're, they're in, you know, their destination hex. The question that we had, or, or one of the questions we raised in the last video was how much to put in there, whether some of it should be automatically found whether some of it need, you need to go and find yourself. Uh, yeah. And and so I, I tried to strike a balance between the two, and, and I do think that there should be a feature of the hex that is obvious. It's not hidden, it, it, you don't, they don't have to go look for it. Now that doesn't mean that they should arrive there automatically, and, and just entering the hex means they, they get there without any trouble, but it should be obvious once they decide that they're, they're not gonna travel through, they're, they're gonna stick around for a while, that there's at least something to do, to visit, to see, to, to explore. And then from there, you can start uh, figuring out how they're gonna find the other contents of the hex uh, and the like. So I, I think we probably, I think if, if I'm remembering right, <laughs> uh, we settled on something like two to three features per hex, mm -hmm. with yeah. at least one of them being obvious and, and sort of spottable or detectable from uh, wherever it is that they're traveling from, and then the rest of them being hidden, or at the very least not as obvious. So what are, what are some of the features that you like to, like to use or like to put in your hexes? There's sort of like a, a standard list, right? Monster lairs, if there's any sort of humanoid uh, bandits, raiders, outlaws, that kind of thing. Uh, any villages for, uh, you know, for people who you know, live in the area. So this is one of those situations where if I've already got an encounter table made up, I'm going to go to that encounter table and sort of see like, all right, what are some of the things that might be encountered in this hex? Is there a, is there a place in here that I can place them so that at the very least I have an idea of like, okay, this is where <laughs> the manticore's lair is. Yeah. It's in, you know, it's in this little like northwest corner of this particular hex. In terms of like things that I always put in or, or uh, you know, are sort of always present, I try to consider the environment 
that uh, you know that, that's around. Who's there? What purpose does it have? Is is this like cultivated farmland in the heart of a of a kingdom or or other sort of nation that uh, is relatively safe? Is this a borderlands region where? Yeah, it's, sometimes it's lawless and, and, and dangerous, but there's also the forces of civilization and authority and the like that are occasionally around. That's going to alter some of what I put in. Or is this like a pure wilderness? There's no one out here but us and the monsters. Yeah. Uh, that's going to alter what I put in. It, it's going to alter who or what is on the encounter table. Mm -hmm. It's going to alter the, the sort of structures that you might find in the hex or... Uh, you know, who's going to be in them. A Borderlands hex might have a, a fort or some other kind of, uh, you know, fortification, but it might not be the original inhabitants. It, it might be that that fort is in the process of being fought over by several different groups and the equilibrium that they have for themselves is disrupted once the players start intervening and investigating. Those are some of my considerations for it. And just thinking for a minute about a, a six mile hex, that's, that's the, that is to say from one side to the other is six miles. From vertex to vertex, it's seven. And then the sides themselves are then three and a half miles. Mm -hmm. And we're now dealing with distances that are easier to conceive of for, for us, uh, you know. Uh, three and a half miles is maybe like a walk or a jog for somebody. You know, they, they, you deal with distances like that every day. And so you have a, a better frame of reference for how far it is. And, and once you kind of start thinking about it, like a, a six mile hex, that's subdividing the whole thing. I think it's like 12 half mile hexes. And it, 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 there's a lot <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that can go on in here. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and and there are some uh, blogs out there where they they take like a Google Earth or, or something like that, a satellite image, and then draw hexes on it to sort of see like, all right, how much can fit in a six mile hex? And what you find out is that a tremendous amount yeah. will fit in there. There might be multiple villages from you know, and, and a lot, particularly if you're talking about like say the medieval demographics of something like 14th century France before the the Black Death. All the villages <laughs> crowded around the right. keep, the local right. keep. And so like there is in, in A Distant Mirror, um, uh, Barbara Tuckman's book about the 14th century, part of, one of the things that struck me was there's an account of, of, of someone from, uh, I believe it's the early years of the Hundred Years' War. They're looking out across the French countryside and everywhere there is smoke represents a village that's been burned by the English or something. And it's like dozens of them as, as this person looks out from a church steeple and sees along the horizon where there's that village and that village and that village in that village. And I think the tendency when we're making fantasy settings is to think in, in terms of like it being really sparse and, and small mm -hmm. and and you don't think like you know that there's dozens of villages within this one locality that are all fairly close to each other <laughs> you know it might take a while to walk between them or travel between them but they but they exist as part of a, a loose-knit sort of uh, you know the, community network and we might think more uh, of like well there's just the one village on the way to the place consider some a map like uh you know from the sword coast or, or any really sort of uh you know just generic fantasy map a lot of times the the smaller places the tiny little villages the way stops the hamlets the thorps whatever they're not on there and so it gives the sense of just well th this is this is it, it's Daggerford, and that's the only other place we're gonna pass until we get to Waterdeep. And, and it, it, you know, when in reality, you're probably passing several little small communities along the way, mm -hmm. and, and anywhere there, there's like a fort or something, maybe there's a mill, there's really a lot packed in there. And that's just talking about like human settlement in, in our own world. If you translate that population density and, and, and what all could be in, in that uh, location, to a fantasy world and you add in monster lairs and fantastical settlements and sites of power and ruins and dungeons and you know the, the fortifications of whatever military sort of protects this area and, and all of these things then you get a you can there's a lot of adventure 
in yeah, one hex. In one hex, yeah. Right. And and there is a style of hex crawl that's more like travel log or, or or the like where you you know, as you wander through and every few hexes you have a random encounter and maybe you stop for a while to check out one of the contents or, or the side of a hex or something. But the goal there is, is movement to a, a destination that, that's outside of the hex system. You know, you're trying to get to a city or a or a dungeon or something like that. Whereas in this case, this is more uh, suitable for the type of campaign that says, you know, you have a you have a, a stretch of unknown uh, real estate that you need to explore. Maybe you've been gifted a, a fiefdom or or something by a, a local authority, and it's like, yeah, you can live here. This is your castle. This is your home base. We're gonna have to make this place safe for everyone. And so in that sense, it, it might be a matter of like clearing out a wilderness hex by hex, which is something that, that some of the older, uh, uh, you know, an activity that the older versions of D&D engaged in more. Although I, I think there's some, uh, some debate over how much, uh, you know, how much like the, the culture of play at the time really embraced this style of game. Yeah. This kind of free form, uh, you know, do what you want sort of style. I like it. I'm skeptical of how widespread it was. Is all. Uh, yeah, know. yeah. <laughs> Might have some uh, very few, very vocal uh, proponents. For I, it. I think probably that's the case. I mean, there's a reason why the, the 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 style of play must have shifted from that towards more like focused quest style adventures and things like that. I'm not as, as up to it as I'd like to be, but uh, that's my sort of my, my mm -hmm. uh, instincts. So everybody wasn't running West March's hex crawls. I, I mean, I'm sure some people were, and, and it's definitely in the game. It's yeah. definitely assumed in the early version of the game, sort of the assumed. Uh, mode of play. So back to how many features per hex. I guess the long-winded way uh, to, to answer that is as many as you are inspired to put. At least two to three. I, I would say that's the minimum uh, as that gives uh, you know different things that they can do if they travel back through there. But if you've got a hex and you're like, my players are going to stay here for a long time, then you can really flesh things out mm -hmm. and you can really dig deep into the fact that you can pack a lot of things in a single hex, let alone the ones surrounding it. Now it becomes more about navigating within that hex and, and sort of like coming up with a, a coherent encounter tables and mm -hmm. terrain features and, and making it a place that you know well enough that you can uh, run it if you need to and that there's enough there that the players can discover things and, yeah. and make connections and sort of move between those locations. So they can find these locations and move between them. What's the best way for a DM to describe these places, terrains, like like when you're in the hex and you're just trying to get across everything that could possibly in here? The, you know. I would say you need to give the players a, a good overview of what the terrain is like inside the hex. So mm -hmm. if we're walking through a desert or something, then it's like, all right, uh, what's the ground like? Is it sandy, shifting uh, soil that, that's constantly moving and, and, it's, and it's gets in your boots and in your, you know, your hair and all that? Uh, is it a uh, rocky sort of Badlands style location that Visibility is dist, uh, you know, limited in the distance, and there's a lot of up and down travel and, and sort of movement along dry gullies, and occasionally like looking out over the ridge. I I, I might ask the players like, you know, if, I, if I'm not otherwise using a system of like, okay, here's the hunter, the scout, the the quartermaster, then I might say something like, okay, which one of you is is on the lookout today? Is any one of you scouting ahead for for danger or something like that? Uh, and depending on what they what the, the the party says, I'll alter my descriptions of of that or or use their answer to kind of inform the information that I will give them. Mm -hmm. If they're in these badlands and and they never pop up out of the dry gullies, then I'm not going to describe much. You know, it's just going to be yeah, you you know, you can't see above the. The hilltop, yeah. <laughs> you know, the gully turns to the right, and it's more gully. <laughs> it's just more gully. Now, the advantage of that is, you know, you're not walking around, uh, in, you know, for everyone else, for everyone the else to, to see. see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're keeping a low profile. Um, so I, I would do that. I give them an idea of what the predominant terrain is like in the hex and the predominant vegetation, if any. And then from there, you can refine it because, you know, a lot of times a hex map, it's just one icon or, or one color or something. And it's like, this is the green hex yeah. and, you know, it's forest. But, you know, forests have clearings, there's brooks and creeks and mm -hmm. there's you know, fields and, and meadows, all kinds of things that, that break up the... Uh, that break up the terrain, and I, I personally, to me, I whatever, whatever environment 
I'm gonna be playing in for a long time. I just do a deep dive on Wikipedia. Yeah. I just go to like all like uh, looking up the geology of it, the biodiversity, what's the, the ecosystem like. Uh, I'll look up geological features, what what sort of vegetation is, and I'm not necessarily looking to like you know teach an earth sciences class about it, but you want to know enough about say uh, the, the natural environment of a place to color your descriptions and bring them to life. Mm -hmm. You don't need to know how everything works inside and out. Um, but you do need to have a good understanding and a grasp of, of what's going on. Otherwise, your descriptions will start to become monotonous and very samey and, and uh, lack that evocative language that uh, makes exploration play so fun. So we have all your, your terrain and everything like that. And we've talked about what kinds of uh, what things you can put in there. Like, what tools do you use to fill that? I do like a lot of random generators, and mm -hmm. if I am zooming in enough on uh, a hex map that I need to start subdividing it, <laughs> if, I'm, yeah. if I'm that zoomed in, then probably what I will do is create a simple 2D6 table for that hex. Now, if I'm looking at like a large region of, of, of wilderness or something, then I might use something more than a 2D6 table just so that I have a, a large uh, you know, range of options, maybe a D20 or even a D100 if I'm feeling ambitious. Um, but a single hex, 2D6, or sorry, 2D6 is fine. That gives you two through 12 and, and gives you a nice bell curve, right? We, we talked about this uh, in both the Random Encounters episode and, and, and in other places. That nice bell curve means that you can put really rare uh, encounters at the two and 12. Um, and then the more common ones are gonna be six, seven, and eight that, you know, and, and then in the middles there, you know, three, four, and five, maybe those are all like non-combat, uh, just sort of in local inhabitants type mm -hmm. counters. And then maybe eight, nine, 10, or, or nine, 10, 11, those are more um, special monsters, unique, uh, unique to the region. Number one, you now know what's in the hex. Mm -hmm. So you now know what you need to include in the hex. Uh, if you've got a tribe of, uh, if you've got goblins on your uh, encounter table, then where do they live? Nearby, or are they in another hex and they just sort of have a local camp? That's something I want yeah, to Yeah, they're patrolling, so maybe like right. the, you, they, they, they are included in multiple hexes? Yes, I will do like that, that as well, yeah. Particularly clusters of hexes might share the same encounter table, or yeah. at least features of the same encounter table. I might switch out a couple of things uh, on it. Usually like the twos and twelves, those uh, those uniques, <laughs> uh, and sometimes it's like uh, there. There are times where it's like the two is always a wizard and the twelve is always a dragon or something like that. Right. And, and using those kinds of rubrics will help you sort of figure it out. So it's like two is your wizard, and then it's locals, and then it's like the most common foes you might face, and then it's more unique foes, and then it's like the big one. And maybe you know the dragon is just spotted from a distance or yeah, uh, circling the red dragon circling <laughs> its volcano. <laughs> right. And, and even here, you can break that down as well. You can have a separate table for what they're doing and and this is why I lean on older procedures and, and mechanics from earlier editions of D&D because I do think that those game designers understood why variety and encounters were so important and they got that variety by random uh, distance that you detect each other there's the mutual surprise role that you would that you would roll both can be surprised one or the other or neither um, and then a random distance, how far away you start. You might start a mile or more away. Uh, or it might be like they're right on top of you. Uh, and then there's an initial disposition. Are they spoiling for a fight? Are they coming back from a fight? Maybe they're from a hunting trip. Maybe they're deserters and just don't want to be left alone. And so having things like that, so that instead of just on your notes, it says like 2d6 orcs, and now you're left to wing it. You just got 2d6 orcs, uh, what do they do? You'll eventually start to fall into patterns and, and ruts and do the mm -hmm. same thing over and over again. And having tables that tell you, okay, I don't need to have that cognitive burden of figuring out every time I roll a random encounter what's going on. I have secondary tables that take just a second to roll on, maybe put them on the inside of DM screen or have them in your notes and you just roll those dice, and within a minute or two you know, okay, I've got seven orcs, they are coming back from a hunt, which means they've got you know, carcass or, or trophies or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, their initial disposition is suspicious, they will try to keep their distance from the party, try to hide, etc. cetera, yeah. uh, and then we're gonna figure out, okay, how close are they, it's like 20 feet? Something must have happened. Now I have a better idea of what that encounter is gonna look like, and I can start uh, feeding clues to the players, 
Uh, make a perception check. Okay, you think you hear voices on the wind. Difficult to tell where they're coming from, but they're distinctly orcish. Um, all right, okay, now we've got a survival roll for tracks. Yeah, you find a, a boot print in, you know, in, in the, a riverbank. Looks like they're headed east, or it was an hour ago. Right. And, and you start to seed things like that in there. The first time you roll an encounter table, it doesn't need to be when they show up. It could be tracks, it could be signs, it could be, you know, maybe uh, they, there was someone wounded that they left behind in a shallow grave or something. Um, those are ways that you can have encounters with the inhabitants of the hex and vary it up. And so mm -hmm. that it's not just uh, yet another <laughs> group of these orcs jump out of nowhere and, and start attacking you, there's, uh, there's a bit of variety there. And you can do the same with, with any of the other uh, inhabitants in, in a hex. If they're non-combatant, if they're supposedly friendly or allies or, or, mm -hmm. or something like that, uh, you can do that the, the same way. And, and really, you can extend that um, to a lot of different encounters, whether you're featuring um, different kinds of terrain in the encounter, just having tables there that let you vary things up are going to help you as the players explore that location. Because once you've like zoomed in on the hex, you really owe it to the players to like really bring this place to life. And if they're gonna pass like five hexes in a day, you just need to say like, oh, the countryside passes you by, rolling hills, nice little pastoral villages and mm -hmm. trees and things like that. And then once they get to their destination, that's when you really like zoom in on it. And, yeah, yeah, and that's when you let them have it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Or, or not. I mean, it could just be like dinner. If you yes. Just roll up dinner by the village. <laughs> oh, y'all are here. Yeah. Just in time for dinner. Just in time. What's on the menu? You are. You and are. Then they're vampires. Pound. Anyway. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Your, your your encounters need to be have layers to them. So layers to them. Yeah. Variety is is. Good. <laughs> what would you say is just a good bit of advice for DMs out there who might be having trouble? Uh, you know, I mean, you've described all these things, but sometimes people can just get in a rut, create, creatively speaking. Yeah. So what's what's a good bit of advice for, for DMs out there? For those who are doing wilderness-style adventures and they want to really feature the wilderness as, uh, you know, an environment for play, they don't want to just rush past it, they don't want to, you know, skip to the dungeon. And and, and sort of as an aside, I, I know that a lot of times that, that hard, that they sometimes call it hard framing or... Um, you know, setting a scene where you're like, okay, we're going to skip past all the boring bits and get right to the action. I, I really am of the opinion that in, in, a, in a kind of traditional style game where you're playing for a few hours around a table or a couch or something like that, those aren't boring bits. Those are opportunities. Number one, they're opportunities you're taking away from your players to in, interact with the environment and, and discover something about your setting and the like. Um, the second part of that is that just like getting to the place you need to go is not always the the best way to play. And sometimes playing out the journey and, and really playing it out and, and really letting the players sort of explore the locations that, they, that they're in as they go through. I mean, number one, it gives you an opportunity to discover something new and have that be the new thing. Mm -hmm. And the players go, ah, yeah, well, we were headed to the dungeon, the caves of whatever, because it was the only thing available. But now we run across these cheese thieves and it's uh, it's on, you know. Mm -hmm. so you, you'd never know what sort of random thing is going to uh, to pop out of play that's going to drive your characters to or to drive your players to go that direction as opposed to their original one. And knowing the environment they're in will really help you <laughs> if they decide to go left and you thought they were gonna go right. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of inspiration, I would just look up online, uh, the, just whatever resources you can find for random tables, both for terrain and inhabitants of the hex. Um, and, and not just ones that are tables that's just sort of like, eh, you know, here's some orcs, here's some griffins, you know, here's some whatever. There's, if you're talking D&D, &D, that's things like, you know, there are those tables in Xanathar's or the DMG. I'm talking more random tables that give you interesting uh, encounters, interesting people to meet, interesting inhabitants, interesting monsters. And if you don't necessarily want to go online and uh, do a bunch of research for it, or you're just sort of wanting to come up with your own, I would just think, like, what are the kind of creatures that live here? What are the uh, inhabitants that live here? And then do the kind of uh, three passes rule where you sort of like, okay, I've got a manticore. All right, how can I make it more fantastical? How can I jazz it up? How can I make it more memorable? Mm -hmm. All right, maybe this manticore is eloquent and obsessed with decorum. 
They're going to eat you. But they do not want you to think they're going to be rude or, or a bore mm -hmm. about it. Well, no, but yeah, they're going to share uh, bread and water with you first. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's A, it's proper, and B, it fattens up the kill. <laughs> right. <there. laughs> yeah, it'll make you sluggish for yeah. when you have to fight back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so then you do another, another pass through it. Okay, um, that's, that's kind of the personality, uh, eloquent and, and, and uh, obsessed with uh, decorum mm -hmm. and the like. Deference. Uh, all right, so that's personality. What about goals? What does the Manticore want? Maybe the Manticore wants, uh, you know, a fine dining companion who will offer, uh, you know, good conversation and and stimulating, uh, you know, mental engagement. Yeah, they're not gonna like harm your wizard, but <laughs> that wizard is not uh, gonna leave anymore because they are companion of the Manticore. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I have so many more dentists or dentists right. to have. <laughs> right, and then what's the third pass on it? Well, maybe the third pass is like uh, an outside factor. You know, someone else that, uh, it's the previous uh, dining companion of the Manticore who is uh, jealous of the party's new found honor position. And now you got a love triangle. And now you got a love triangle with, uh, you know, <laughs> whoever that, that particular uh, creature might be. Um, <laughs> and so that, that's an example of what you might do. And, and that all starts from you rolling up Manticore on, a, on an encounter table and then just giving it a few passes. Time is a lot of times what you just need. You don't you don't necessarily always need to do it at once, but mm -hmm. um, that's kind of an example of that. I, I would say because a hex can be uh, the location for so many different adventures, you want to provide those distinctions. If, if they're just passing through, if, you, if they don't intend to stay and, and stick around, or or you know their their destination is is still many hexes away, it, maybe you don't need to work out a ton. Of what they, you know, what's in there. But if this is where they're going to stay for a while, uh, you know, work it out. Maybe really map out that interior of the hex. And mm -hmm. like I said, if we're doing a six-mile hex, then from uh, side to side, it, it's twelve half-mile hexes, and then those half-mile <laughs> hexes can be further broken down into what was it, one twenty-fourth? Yeah, one twenty-fourth mile, which is roughly two hundred feet. And now we're talking. You know, you can map it's that a battle out. Map. Yeah, you can map that out on your on your table if you're really going to stay there in that location for a while, then you might do that. You might go down two levels and just see like, wow, I, I, there's, a, <laughs> there's a, mm -hmm. a lot here. Um, you've got monster lairs, you've got places where people live, you've got all these things. How do they find their way around all of that? You're going to have to make survival rolls mm -hmm. or something like that, right? Do they have a map? Do they have a map? Do they have a local guide, right? Like that's Tomb of Annihilation. Tomb or of Annihilation ranger. does it, or a, ranger. <laughs> a scout, or ranger, or something. Uh, but Tomb of Annihilation does that by by having those guides that they pick up yeah. in Port Nine Zaru, and you can have it be that like the guide is there less to you know guide them from hex to hex, and is there like okay once you're in this hex I can tell you how to find this mm -hmm. thing, you know. The legend has it that there's a whatever up on that mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we got to find the mountain, go to this place, uh, and sort of uh, you know, find it. The, mm -hmm. the, the guide will hmm, guide you there. Yep. But maybe you've got a player who's a, a local, or a character who's a local that can serve the same function, or they hire someone from a village, or they use magic, or, or they just are very adept at, at scouting around. Now, for me, I like to use two things for navigating the inside of a hex. Uh, one of them is the, uh, the point crawl model. And point crawl is like a hex crawl, but with all of the middle, <laughs> uh, it's only destinations that get connected. And, and uh, it's even more abstract, say, between destination A and destination B than, say, a hex crawl is. But once you're in a hex and you, say, have six or eight locations there, a couple of villages, a couple of whatevers, uh, monster lair, adventure locations, etc. Um, you might start connecting them and figure out, okay, uh, this one's, all right, one, two, three, four, five hexes away, that's uh, two and a half miles, and you start connecting them that way, you can get a sense for like, all right, where are they all in relation to each other? How long does it take to get to them? And then once you've made those connections, maybe you say, uh, okay, this is a DC 20 uh, travel. You know, to get from point A to point B here, DC 20, because you got to go through a lot of broken terrain and ground and stuff like that. But getting between location Z and X, that's just two villages connected by a road. No role necessary. Right. And, and having that laid out, uh, since we're sort of talking uh, about D&D &D and using that as a, a touchstone for other systems, 
Uh, there was an earth, unearthed arcana a few months back about uh, from Mike Merles about exploring the wilderness, and I think they used a, a fourth edition setting as an example of that, the Moon Hills maybe, or a caravan uh, way stop. And uh, there's just rumors that they'll pick up. That's a good way for them to figure out what's in the ter what's nearby, what's the terrain like, who are the inhabitants. You know, start coming up with skill challenges that are based off of those, uh, uh, based off of the skill checks to get from point A to point B. Maybe there's a you know a, a, a flooded creek or something mm -hmm. like that, and and if or you a lose your range. or a you mountain range, or a mountain range, yeah, you have to go over it. And and you know, it's, it's springtime, the the roads washed out because of the snows and everything, or you've got to pass through uh, you know, a bog that has kind of an elevated road that, that helps you get through it, but that's been partially uh, you know, in disrepair and is not particularly uh, stable anymore. A mechanic that's similar to skill challenges, skill challenges were introduced in fourth edition D&D and basically in, in, in a nutshell, sort of like get uh, X successes before Y failures, <laughs> kind yeah. of like a, a death save. Right, like get three of these, succeed on three of these before you fail on three of these. That's kind of in a nutshell. The uh, skill challenges were a lot more complicated than that in play, but that's sort of the, the base of it. Adventures in Middle Earth uses this, where you uh, roll up a number of random events based on uh, both the difficulty of the journey, how well uh, your party prepared as they were setting out, mm -hmm. and then the uh, you know the inherent skill of your guide who's who's navigating the wilderness, and you might get encounters that are like. All right, uh, the scout has to roll stealth or perception, their choice to get past this thing. If they fail, then this. If they pass, then this will happen. And then there's like, if they fail by five or more, this will happen. And so in Adventures in Middle Earth, as you're uh, moving through, and presumably this is also the way it works in the One Ring as well, you start losing hit dice, gaining exhaustion levels, the, maybe you have an, a proper fight uh, and there's not going to be a long rest for a while to recover from it. So you, it's possible to like arrive at your destination just haggard yeah. and absolutely run ragged um, because of the way that their events work down. It's not just mm -hmm. combat, it's you know dealing with uh, depressing weather and uh, phenomenon or, yeah. or strange omens and signs that you see. And, mm -hmm. and we're just talking about mundane locations. Gosh, you start adding in magic and fantastical things and there's all sort of weird stuff that you can, you know, maybe you've got a, you know, a, a, a place of power that exerts a certain uh, influence over the land and that, that that colors things. Or there's uh, a, a monster with a very powerful lair that has regional effects. Again, uh, speaking in fifth edition terms, but uh, all of those things are things, and, and many more, are, are things to consider when making one hex. And if you're committed to a kind of wilderness exploration play and, and you want the players to have to kind of search around and ask around and, and really get involved with the setting and, and, and interact with it, then this is one way to sort of do that it, because you've really fleshed everything out and, and presented a location for play that's not like all about the backstory and the history and all that other stuff. It's about playing in this location, getting players from point A to B. Uh, it, having them meet interesting inhabitants and having dynamic encounters and, and after they've spent a few sessions in that location, gotten to know it, then you'll find that they develop, start to develop a kind of attachment to these locations that they spend a lot of time in. Um, and yeah, that's a, a very satisfying way to, to, to run a game. Exactly. Hexactly? Hexactly. There you are. Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, Starward Bound, Unearthly Twilights, and Land Between Two Rivers, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. It's not even new. Yep. Yeah. Dude, right. I went to bed at 8.45 last night. Yeah. Like, I made myself sleep in, and sleeping in was 5.45. Yep. Yeah, I was up around, I was up around 6 no. I want to go down a rail. Oh. <laughs> I'm so glad I got that up <laughs> The answer is no. No. He does not want to go down the stairs. Nah. He wants to slide down the rail. I think you should let him slide down the rail. What? Even though WebBM is not insured. Even though you can freaking get right here and get an amazing angle of my either triumph or ultimate downfall. All right. Wait, there is a pattern of the <sighs> well, see, now so much has been built up. Yeah, I know. 
You did this. You built it up. You did this. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm gonna go down the stairs one way or another. I have an awesome That's shot. All right. He's gonna. It's just maybe. What could go wrong? I fall. Crack his head open on that. Break concrete. my leg. Oh, pardon me. Sorry. Probably not. He's pretty agile. He's more agile than. He's more he is. See? See? It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> you just slide down. We don't have insurance. You can't no, do that. You just slide down. You just put your butt Nothing. on. Nothing. I didn't slide, slide down. down the rail. 